The Railway Museum houses some of the best examples of railway models in the country. Many models have been lovingly built by railway enthusiasts throughout the years, and some families would donate the models to the National Collection for thousands to enjoy. One of the models included is the model of the Princess Anne. You might be forgiven that I'm talking about this Princess Anne, and while she is amazing, I'll be featuring her later. No, I'm talking about this princess, and how she became the Queen of the Channel. As I mentioned in an earlier video, when the railways was nationalised, they inherited more than just locomotive stock and tracks. They also inherited many shipping routes and ferries which turned out to be quite successful. British Rail amalgamated all the shipping companies together and in a nutshell created Sealink, which provided links to Ireland and mainland Europe. Although successful, the speed that the ferries went was painfully slow especially from Dover to Calais. People were keen to get to their destination faster and faster, and the slower ferries just were not cutting it. In the days before the Channel Tunnel, ferry crossings would take several hours. In the early 50s, British inventor Sir Christopher Cockrell realised that the main drawback of ferries was the drag the water created, slowing the calf down. He surmised that if he could lift the craft out of the water, the power that is used to eliminate the drag could be used for sheer raw speed. The easiest way to lift a craft out of water was to use air jets underneath it, as the Forney Craft Company had discovered years earlier. But Cockrell improved on the theory. He surmised that if the air was directed into a narrow jet around the craft, the air would form a momentum curtain which would limit air escaping and mean that the engine needed to maintain the curtain could be much smaller. He tested his theory at home with two tin cans and a vacuum cleaner. Cockrell patented the design and took it to several shipbuilders and aircraft industries. The two industries scoffed the idea and refused to back the prototype. Cockrell then took the design to the British government. The government, while not interested in giving the project funding, took Cockrell's idea and put it on the government's secrets list. This move shut down Cockrell's plans entirely as the act forced him to keep the plans out of public knowledge. In 1958, the government declassified the designs as news of similar crafts were being developed and the government, now keen to develop the idea, introduced Cockrell to the National Research Development Corporation and aerospace manufacturer Sanders Rowe, who helped develop a full-size prototype. It was introduced to the public in 1959 and carried four people successfully across the channel at a staggering 28 miles an hour. Thanks to this success, a new sub-company was created called the Hovercraft Developments Limited, with Cockrell as its technical director. Amidst the clamour of disgruntled passengers, British Rail began to take notice. In 1965, British Rail began talks to set up a new division of its Sealink company. It wanted to work with France and it partnered with the French railway operator SNCF. Both saw the appeal of a Fastlink service and in 1965, British Rail Hovercraft or Sea Speed was born. The first hovercraft that the new company would acquire would actually be a prototype. The SRN4 was a combined passenger and vehicle ferry capable of carrying up to 30 cars and 254 passengers. With a top speed of 83 knots or 95 miles an hour, it cruised across the channel in less than 45 minutes. Sea Speed would research different options about its stations for its services. They wanted to ensure that in the event of a failure or in bad weather, passengers would be able to transfer to the Sealink ferries with minimal fuss. This eliminated many smaller and less commercial docks. Folkestone was also considered off the list too, as it was unable to cater for large hovercraft. That really left Dover as the ideal choice, while across the channel the French had decided to operate from Boulogne and offered to build a railway from the terminal. The two railways built large landing stations. Closer to home, plans were also put in place from a route from Southampton to the Isle of Wight. 
1966, Sea Speed ran its first ever passenger run across the Solent from the Isle of Wight to Southampton. The craft was smaller and only meant to carry passengers only. In its first year alone, the new hovercraft carried over 67,000 people with new routes and a second hovercraft was planned. In August 1968, Sea Speed set off for its first ever overseas run. The hovercraft was renamed Princess Margaret. In 1970, thanks to its success, the Princess Anne was added and ran from Dover to Calais. Anne was a superstar and raced across the channel with ease, breaking the record of the fastest car carrying commercial channel crossing in a stunning 22 minutes, a time which as of yet has not been beaten. The company however were not alone. A rival company, Hoverloid, was created around the same time as Sea Speed, and the two competed for profits and the market. The hovercraft ran with little fuss for many years, but British Rail were not happy with the results. With the exception of two years, Sea Speed turned a pre-tax loss year on year. If it wasn't for British Rail keeping the company afloat, then Sea Speed would have been made insolvent in less than 15 years after it opened. Both Princess Anne and Margaret were modified to carry more than double its original capacity. However, this did nothing to help the large hole of debt appearing in British Rail's pocket. In 1976, to cut costs, Sea Speed decided to cull its Solent routes. It sold both Hovercraft and its routes to rival company Hover Travel. Hover Travel cut the Cow Southampton route, but kept the more popular Portsmouth to Ride route. It simply didn't help, and faced with mounting pressure to account for losses across all of its network, Sea Speed offered a merger with its only rival Hoverloid, who were having problems of their own and decided that for the future of hover travel, the merger must take place. In 1981, Sea Speed and Hoverloid merged to become Hoverspeed, its own company in its own right, and unable to cover Sea Speed any further, British Rail sold its 50% stake in the company for a mere pound. The buyout completely removed British Rail of its burden, and for the first time since the hovercrafts were introduced, they finally made a profit. It was a mere 0.5%, but at least they had broken the debt spiral they were in months earlier. Hover speed it firstly increased its pricing and pushed a very aggressive advertising campaign, citing the ferries as the rivals for the first time. Profits continued to rise and it appeared that the dark days were behind them. Hover Speed was bought by British Ferries and continued to make a decent profit margin. Being part of a bigger group also allowed the company access to cheaper fuel and better facilities. By the early 1990s the hovercraft's popularity and novelty was beginning to wane and new options were being looked at to replace the fleet. The first catamaran service was introduced in 1991. It was more fuel efficient and were faster. The end though came in 1997 when a super sea cat came into service. These new super fast ferries coupled with the channel tunnel spelt the end of Princess Margaret and the Princess Anne and both were withdrawn from service at the turn of the century. It wasn't all doom and gloom for the hovercraft. The now privately owned services from Portsmouth to Ride were very successful and even to this day offer the locals a 10 minute ride across the Solent. The smaller hovercrafts can't take cars, but the hovercrafts are a lifesaver for many commuters who work on the mainland. So what of Anne and Margaret? Well both were preserved in the Hovercraft Museum for a time after being purchased by a private collector. The collector and the museum talked for many years about restoring both vessels, however Margaret was scrapped in 2018. Her sister's fate was uncertain, but museum bosses persevered and managed to get a lease on her from the owners. Many of the features from Margaret was donated to Anne to help bring her back to glory. Princess Anne's fate was secured in 2016 when she was entered into the historic ship's register with the likes of HMS Victory and HMS Warrior. Her registration would preserve her from the Cutter's Torch for years to come and she was recognised for her efforts. When I was younger, I had the pleasure of going on the hovercraft to the Isle of Wight. 
and although events out of my control made my family cut the trip short, going on the hovercraft is certainly a unique experience which I would definitely recommend. The landing areas at Dover are still visible and although the station is now a fast food restaurant, but you can imagine these huge machines beaching themselves with a massive roar as they came in from the sea. If you want to see hovercrafts in action and can't get down to the south of the UK, the website Railcam offers a live stream looking over the ride landing and the railway. For a small fee, you can watch the hovercraft as well as other major stations and many heritage lines 24-7. As for the model, she sits in the warehouse. No one really knows who made it, but it did come from the railway board, so it's very possible that this model may have been used as either a promotional tool or a tool to invest, entice investors. In any case, Princess Anne has earned her spot in the National Collection. That's rather an unusual but awesome reminder that railway history can be found anywhere, even on the sea itself.